Good morning. Welcome to worship at the United Church of Underhill, Underhill here on this second Sunday of Easter. We remember that Easter is a season, not a day, and so we will continue to celebrate the resurrection for many weeks to come. We welcome all of you who are here in this building, as well as those worshiping online today or at a later time. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, know that you are welcome here in this place. So our worship today is going to be a little bit different, only a little bit, <laughs> said the pastor never before, a little bit different today because there's something happening tomorrow. What's happening tomorrow? The solar eclipse. So some people are a little excited about this solar eclipse. So I thought, what a perfect opportunity to explore some spiritual themes of light and darkness together as a church. And to do that, we are going to rely heavily on this book, by Barbara Brown Taylor. It's called Learning to Walk in the Dark. It was written many years ago. Women in the Word read it this year. I read it much longer ago. Some of it dusty, a bit rusty on it, but I've pulled out a few gems from this book that are gonna help us think maybe a little differently about light and darkness. So to start us off, I have a question. This is not rhetorical. I want answers. It's also not a trick question. So what do we associate with darkness? Rest. Rest. Danger, peace, evil, a solar eclipse, stars, nighttime, was that it? Scared, scared, yeah. What are some things that the church traditionally associates with darkness? Evil, sin, death, yeah. So for Barbara Brown Taylor, she writes that basically, for her, darkness is shorthand for anything that scares her. So we heard that, scared, right? She, like everyone else, or many other people, was taught that darkness was something best to be avoided. And she imagines that if she could avoid it entirely, she would. Except then she says this. The problem is, when despite all my best efforts, the lights, literally or figuratively, have gone off in my life. I have not died. The monsters have not dragged me out from under the bed and taken me back to their lair. The witches have not turned me into a bat. Instead, I have learned things in the dark that I could never have learned in the light, things that have saved my life over and over again, so that there is really only one logical conclusion I need darkness as much as I need light. There are things we learn in the dark that we do not learn in the light. So we're going to explore that a little, deep, little more deeply today in worship together. But as I said already, whoever you are, wherever you are in life's journey, whether that journey is in a period of light or darkness or somewhere in between, know that you are welcome here and that God waits to meet you in this hour. Good morning. My name is Robin, and I'm serving as worship assistant today. Please join in the call to worship. Your words are found in bold. Let us kneel in the darkness until, until we see God's light emerge. Let us wait with hope-filled hearts as Christ's image grows within us and shows us life. Let him speak to us and teach us love until we open our hearts to be his home. Let us join in singing together. Come and find the quiet center found in the faith we sing, number 2128. Thank you. 
Let us join together in the prayer of confession. O God, God, our God, God, creator creator of the the stars stars of of night, forgive us when we forget that darkness and light go hand in hand, that the the suffering of another another is our suffering, that the joy we know is not to be hoarded, but shared, that just as light warms and energizes us, so darkness calms us and gives us rest. Sometimes we must dwell in the shadow places of fear and grief. Sometimes we are called to be light bearers. Help us to discern your paths to and through light and darkness. Forgive us when we choose for ease and convenience rather than faithfulness and truth. Ours is a God of the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. In our darkness and in our light, God is steadfast and forgiving. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. We thank you, holy God, for day and night, for darkness and light, for the strife and the joy, and for making us whole. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. Let us turn and offer signs of God's peace to those worshiping online. Peace be with you. And here in this room, too, as the Spirit leads, offer signs of God's peace to one another. I I told him he could say because it's about to be kids' time.
Amen. And if any of God's children want to join me and Aaron up here, now's the time. Everyone, how are you? Good. How was your week? Good. What's happening tomorrow? A solar eclipse. And that's the ring stage Pierce is informing us. So it's on the screen. Yeah. Ah, all right. So, what have you been learning about the eclipse in school? Yeah. So, what do we? How are we going to look at the eclipse tomorrow? Uh, glasses are using a cardboard box. This is for everybody, not just children, right? Glasses or a cardboard box. I meant to bring glasses to demonstrate, but reminder: like you put them on, looking down, right? Before you look up, turn down before you take them off. We're going to all protect our eyes, right? All right, so yes, we're talking today about light and darkness because in the middle of the day tomorrow, it's going to get dark. How strange, how strange. People are really excited about this happening. So I thought today we would talk about, okay, what are some things that happen during the day? You're normally. The sun's out, sometimes it's cloudy. What are some things we do, and grown-ups can help too, what are some things we do during the day? Are things that are special about the day. We eat. We eat in the day, most of our meals. You make forts, right? We're usually awake. We're active in the day. We have breakfast in the day, yeah. Any special things you can do in the day that you can't do at night? or that's easier, a lot easier to do in the day? Did I hear it? Shovel the snow. Shovel the snow. <laughs> Better done in the day than at night. Let the, sun melt the snow. Let the sun melt the snow. Better done in the day than at night. Ski, Ski hike, yeah. swim. Lots of fun outside things that are not impossible to do at night, but a little harder or require more equipment. All right, let's think about the night. What are some special things that happen only at night? You sleep. Yes. You snuggle stuffies. You snuggle stuffies. Listen to audiobooks to put you to sleep. Yeah. See stars. See stars. That's something that's near impossible to do in the day. And a bright moon. Campfires. It's not impossible. So I said near impossible. All right, lawyers among us. Okay, anything else special about night, grown-ups? Fireflies. They tend to come out at dusk. Bats, that's right. The sunset. Yeah, special things. That's right, the stars you can see up above in the dark. That's right. So I brought today a special blessing prayer for us. Blessing prayers are interesting. You know, often when we pray, we ask God for things, like, God, help me with this. God, I need to feel better. Or sometimes we thank God. We say, thank you for my family, for the food I have to eat, for all these good things. A blessing prayer is a little bit different. When we say, blessed is the night, it's kind of like we're saying, Oh, God, I see what you're doing there. That night is actually kind of special. Blessed is the day. I see, God, you have made the day for some special things. So I have some blessings about things that happen in the dark and the light, and we can add to it, kind of like what we just did. So blessed is the dark in which our dreams stir. We didn't talk about that. Dreaming often happens in the dark. Blessed is the dark of earth where seeds come to life, what? right? Seeds are 
born, shall we say, or they sprout in the dark under the earth. Blessed are the depths of the ocean where no light shines, and it's the womb of all earthly life. Life began in the depths of the ocean. Yeah. All right, so let's try this as a church family. Blessed is the dark where? Where we dream. What else is special in the dark? Blessed is the dark of secret surprises. <laughs> I'm going to interpret that one. I think there was another one I missed. This is your homework for the week. This is your homework for the week. All right, let's turn to the day. Blessed is the light in which we awake. We talked about that. Blessed is the light that sparkles on the waters. Blessed is the light that calls the tree forth from the seed. Ooh, did you hear that? We need the darkness for the seed and the light. And blessed is the light that calls the shadow forth from the tree. Isn't that an interesting one? Anything else we want to add? Blessed is the light. Blessed is the eighth of April. Blessed is the eighth of April. That's a good one. Church, what else happens in the light? Blessed is the light where? Where we hear the birds chirping. Where we see colors. Where we eat breakfast. Where we feel the warmth of the sun. All right. And one final blessing for us. Blessed are we as we move through darkness and through the light. Amen. Amen. All right, especially grown-ups, be thinking about all those blessings of dark and light, especially as we gather tomorrow with glasses, with glasses to watch the eclipse. All right. Amen and amen. You may go down to Sunday, friends, and I believe you'll be back to join us for communion at the end of the service, okay? You can take your Pokemon down, too. Our first reading comes from Genesis, chapters 1 and 2, selected verses. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, let there be light, and so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning, the first day. And then a bit later, God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will mark events, sacred seasons, days, and years. They will be lights in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth. And that's what happened. God made the stars and two great lights, the larger light to rule over the day and the smaller light to rule over the night. God put them in the dome of the sky to shine on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw, saw how good it was. There was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And then later still, the heavens and the earth and all who live in them are completed. On the sixth day, God completed all the work that he had done. And on the seventh day, God rested from all the work he had done. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. 
because on it God rested from all the work of creation. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So today you get two sermons, but they're really short. So Robin just read our first creation account. Here at the very beginning of our scripture, we get this division of light and darkness. That's how the whole thing kicks off. Darkness was, we heard, and then God made light. And then a little later on, God creates the celestial lights to rule the day and rule the night. And in this origin story, I suppose it's a little open to interpretation, but there is no value really attributed to light over dark. Sure, the sun is bigger and brighter, but generally speaking, this first creation story is a poetic telling of what is. There is day and there is night, and it is good. But as we talked about a bit at the beginning of the service, we have come to weigh these times of the 24-hour cycle, these experiences of light and darkness, differently. So again, I'm going to read from Barbara Brown Taylor. This is a lengthier excerpt where she describes how our metaphors of light and darkness have evolved and influenced us spiritually. So she writes, from the earliest times, Christians have used darkness as a synonym for sin, ignorance, spiritual blindness, and death. Perhaps many of us along the way have heard prayers such as this one, deliver us, O Lord, from the powers of darkness. Shine into our hearts the brightness of your Holy Spirit and protect us from all perils and dangers of the night. She continues, at the theological level, this creates all sorts of problems. It divides every day in two, pitting the light part against the dark part. It tucks all the sinister stuff into the dark part, identifying God with the sunny part and leaving you to deal with the rest of the things on your own time. This separation implies things about dark-skinned people and sight-impaired people that are not true. And worst of all, it offers people of faith a giant closet into which they can store everything that threatens or frightens them without thinking too much about it. It rewards them for their unconsciousness, offering spiritual justification to turn away. Yeah, turn away toward the light from those things. Taylor calls this well-lit side of the divided way full solar spirituality, since it focuses on staying in the light of God around the clock, both absorbing and reflecting the sunny side of faith. She writes this, you can usually recognize a full solar church by its emphasis on the benefits of faith, and that includes a sure sense of God's presence, certainty of belief, divine guidance in all things, and reliable answers to prayer. Members strive to be positive in attitude, firm in conviction, helpful in relationship, and unwavering in faith. This sounds like heaven on earth. Who wouldn't like to dwell in God's light 24-7? Well, I think we know the answer. She doesn't. <laughs> she doesn't want to dwell there. She writes this there is an alternative approach that she calls lunar spirituality, in which the divine light available waxes and wanes with the season. Think of the moon. She writes, some nights it is as round and bright as a headlight. Other nights it is thinner than the sickle hanging in the garage. Some nights it is high in the sky, other nights low over the mountains. Some nights it is altogether gone leaving a vast web of stars that are brighter in its absence. For some of us, the moon is a truer mirror for the soul than the sun which looks the same way every day. So that's what she calls full solar spirituality and lunar spirituality, and we can already tell the bias that she is writing toward. Her spirituality is more of the lunar sort, with time in God's light waxing and waning. 
And I would agree that full solar spirituality, as she describes it, seems a bit extreme. Reminds me of the phrase toxic positivity, if that's one you're familiar with. It's where people are not only unflappable, but are constantly insistent that everything is fine or it will be fine in a way that can bulldoze any not fine feelings that may emerge. Or as she writes, it pushes them into the dark closet. That's not so healthy. But I do think there is room for a healthy approach for those of us who prefer or find ourselves experiencing a mostly solar spirituality. There are cloudy days, sure, but home base is in the light, where vision is clear or clearer, where body and soul are warmed, and where perhaps there are many and varied opportunities to gather with other people, other companions. Again, not that darkness necessitates solitude, but sometimes it's harder to find our conversation partners in the dark. So we're gonna take a brief moment for silent reflection. It's not a trick, it's not a trap, we're not gonna share things later. This is entirely interior silent reflection where we can think about, okay, where do I lean in terms of solar or lunar spirituality? There's not a wrong answer, there's not a better answer. But as we figure out where we lean, we can also think of a couple of things that go with that. So number one, without asking, I can guarantee that we are neither 100% solar or 100% lunar in this, in this room and on this stream. So as we think about that, know that whichever approach you take, you are not alone in it. Your neighbors are probably closer than you realize. That's one thing to consider. Another thing to consider is to honor that both lunar and solar spiritual experiences bring gifts to the table. The spiritual experience we are having as well as the opposite one give us insights into the nature of God, into how we understand our purpose in this world, into how we come to know and serve our neighbor. In light and dark, we can deepen these understandings, and so we honor both. And then finally, as we think about solar and lunar spirituality and where we might lean, we also think about just because one of those is home to us doesn't mean we're never going to be asked to cross over to the other side. Light and dark are both needed for growth, as we saw in that children's blessing. The seed is in the dark, the light calls the life forth. So even as we think about where our home is, we may recall seasons where we have had to journey in the other realm. And maybe those seasons were uncomfortable, maybe even a little painful. But if we learn things in the dark that we don't learn in the light, or things in the light that we can't see in the dark, perhaps we might be able to continue blessing some of those moments where we've journeyed beyond our comfort zone. So as we hear this song played, now the silence, Think about where we live, by the moon, by the sun, somewhere in the middle, and the gifts and blessings that come with that.
Our gospel reading today is from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Jesus appears to Thomas and the disciples. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my fingers in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing, you will have life in his name. Robin just read the lectionary passage for us today. And over the next several weeks, we will continue to get these glimpses of Jesus' resurrection appearances. But as the gospel writers make clear with their tomb stories, and Barbara Brown Taylor also points out in her book, there weren't really witnesses to the resurrection. There were witnesses to Jesus after he was raised, but no one saw what happened in the tomb. No one saw him get up. He was just up. Here again is the author. As many years as I have been listening to Easter sermons, I have never heard anyone talk about this part. Resurrection is always announced with Easter lilies, the sound of trumpets, bright streaming light. But it did not happen that way. If it happened in a cave, it happened in complete silence, in absolute darkness, with the smell of damp stone and dug earth in the air. New life starts in the dark. Whether it is a seed in the ground, a baby in the womb, or Jesus in the tomb, it starts in the dark. Even today's story has some darkness about it. It is evening. We don't know if there's still light in the sky or not, but the disciples are in a room behind closed doors. And then Jesus manages to get in in a kind of mystical way. And then eight days later, he does it again, and this time the doors were even locked. There are no trumpets announcing this Jesus. We can almost imagine the disciples' shocked reaction, like, ah, how'd you get in here? 
And then it takes a few times for this new life, this life of the Jesus movement to take root. Everyone's always talking about doubting Thomas, but they are all still gathered eight days later behind locked doors, all of them. And Jesus shows up in the midst of that fear, offering them peace, filling them with joy, and giving them a commission for the next part of the journey. New life starts in the dark. So we'll again take just a brief moment for reflection and think about and bless the dark places where for us, for people we know, for life in general, we have seen that seed take root in the dark or where we're praying it might yet take root. So let's prayerfully reflect one more time together. And so we'll continue in prayer, pausing for a moment in our worship where we lift before God and one another the joys and concerns, glimpses of light, patterns of darkness, whatever it is that we feel we need to share or want to share with one another this day. After sharing a prayer, you can conclude by saying, this is my prayer, to which we'll all respond. This is our prayer, starting in the room and then moving to those worshiping online. We didn't have this opportunity last week, and I know there were some prayers that people were ready to share on Easter. Are you ready? All right, I'm going to come back to you. This is a prayer of gratitude to have friends and family with us to um, share in this fun, wonderful, exciting event tomorrow. This is my prayer. Yes, we have a celebration prayer. My son has finally got his fiance all the way here from Mexico. You can do it legally. If you're patient, very patient. <laughs> this is my prayer. This is our prayer, yes. Uh, Mark sent me a beautiful picture of all of them at the airport. It was like midnight. Yeah. Like, this is a different kind of Easter vigil. It was Easter Sunday morning, and this picture of the family all together at the airport arriving just last week. So we are so thankful for David and Alma and wish them all the joy as they begin their life together, together here in the States. I have a prayer of strength for a family friend, Mike, um, whose retirement on April 1st coincided with a diagnosis of late stage pancreatic cancer. And so our, our family is trying to support theirs um, in a very difficult time. Uh, this is my prayer.
Let us pray. God, we come before you on this holy day, the day that you called good. And we lay at your feet glimpses of light and darkness, single moments and longer seasons that we travel through with you in this company of companions. And with the questions we have, the anger we share, the abundant joy that we cannot keep to ourselves, it is hard to know sometimes where to begin. We take step by single step, asking you to banish our disbelief asking you to focus us on the tasks, the journeys that you have for us, even at this time. Because we know in life, in death, in life beyond death, you are with us. We are not alone. And so we gather these prayers, spoken and unspoken, heard and unheard, known and unknown, and trust them into your almighty and eternal care. Amen. As we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings, you probably noticed today we have a very special thing going on. If you didn't see the envelopes in your bulletins, you may have seen the email announcement, or you may be smelling what is coming from the room behind me or downstairs. After worship today, the missions ministry is hosting uh, what's called a fancy fellowship. Um, and this is also a fundraiser for one great hour of sharing. So this is the day of the year where we take a special collection to fund the, um, the global ministries, which the United Church of Christ and Disciples of Christ partner together on. That means that then throughout the year when there is a need because of a natural disaster or a certain mission project, 95% of what's, con what's collected at those times can go straight to that need because we're funding the organization through today's offering. So we give with grateful hearts and with thanksgiving for the many who are doing that mission work in this country and all around the globe on behalf of the church.
Amen. <laughs> I think we have the wrong words on the screen for that doxology. That's okay, my bad, but we can still pray together. Let us pray. Generous and surprising God, <laughs> when we thought that death had claimed the last word, you amazed us with the resurrection. Surprise us again as you turn these humble offerings into gifts that will change the world. We lay at your feet the whole of our lives, darkness, light, and everything in between, trusting that you will use us in all times and places to witness to your gospel. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The kids have arrived just in time as we begin our celebration of communion. This table does not belong to the United Church of Underhill, the United Methodist Church, the United Church of Christ. This table belongs to Jesus. And if you are seeking Jesus, you are welcome at this table today as we feast together. Would you join me in the responsive prayer of thanksgiving? It will be on the screen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We offer our thanks and praise, O God, for the glories of creation, for the black velvet of the night sky that allows the stars to twinkle and the moon to glow, for the sun that peeks over the horizon and paints the sky as it sets. We offer our thanks and praise for the heavens and the inhabitants of heaven, for the cloud of witnesses. We on earth sing with them above as we say together these words. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Holy One, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Born in the stillness of night, he knew the love of family and stranger alike. Threatened by evil, he fled to a distant land. Endowed with the Spirit, he taught about grace and forgiveness. He healed the sick and confronted the powerful. In humility and trust, he lay down his life that he might rise again and bring new life to the world. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For the gifts of his life and presence, we give you thanks, O God, and ask for one thing more, that your spirit descend now upon us, upon this table, that the bread we break and the cup we share would be transformed from their ordinariness to sacred things. As we share one loaf and one cup, may we become one with the world, bringing good news to all. And hear us now as we are bold to say together the words Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We will commune today by coming forward to this table. You may come from the center aisle and then return to the side aisle. Before you will be a tray with both gluten-free bread and a cup of grape juice that you may take as you receive communion with the words, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ. If you would prefer that the ushers bring communion to you, kindly put your hand in, in the air as people are communing. We'll be sure not, not to miss you. And then when you're done, you may put the cups right back in the tray where you have them, right? All right, come, I believe all is prepared. Amen.
There's always enough at God's table. And so let us pray together with thankful hearts. We thank you once again for this meal, this day, this gift of resurrection. Send us out into your world to be the presence of love and hope to all who despair and fear, that all, whether in darkness or light, may have life and life abundant. Alleluia, alleluia, amen. Amen, so we'll take a few moments if there are announcements for the good of the church as we conclude our worship together. Everyone is just ready for fancy fellowship, so. So I've got, I've got good news in that regard. Our closing hymn, He Lives, number 310 in the Methodist hymnal, is, as you can hear, we've been using recorded music today. This one is a fast one. It was recorded at a time when we were on Zoom, and that was fine because we could keep up. It's a little harder when we're in the room, so get ready, buckle in. We had a nice quiet start to the service. We are going to go out at a running pace, all right? Let's see if we can keep up. Let's stand and sing this beautiful resurrection hymn, He Lives, number 310. that wasn't so bad. So now go forth into this day, this week, this special moment for all of us, aware of the blessings of light and of darkness, aware of the seasons we are called to walk in the realm that we would prefer not to, but that every day God is with us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us this day and even evermore. Amen. Go in peace.